Imagine a tiny 2x2 two two chessboard, where each square can be colored either black or white. How many different colorings are there? That's easy. Since there are two choices for each square and four squares, there are two to the fourth total colorings. But some of these colorings are basically the same. They're just a rotation or a reflection away. If we only want to count colorings that are meaningfully different, the problem becomes much more interesting. To start, we have to get formal about what it means for two colorings to be the same. For our purposes, there are eight transformations to consider. We can flip horizontally, vertically, or across either diagonal. We can rotate by 90, 180, or 270 degrees. We can also do nothing. These eight transformations represent everything you can do to the square and still have it look the same, so they form its symmetry group. Now we can separate the colorings into sets, called orbits, that look the same under the symmetry group. The end goal, then, is to find the number of orbits. For a given coloring in a given orbit, we can look at where all the transformations send it. Because of the symmetry of the group structure, the number of transformations that turn the original coloring into any other coloring is the same. In particular, we can look at the transformations that keep the coloring the same, called its stabilizers. For each coloring, the number of stabilizers must be equal to the number of transformations divided by the number of elements in the orbit. That means that, if we add up the number of stabilizers for every element in the orbit, we'll get the number of transformations. And if we add up the number of stabilizers over every coloring in every orbit, we'll get the number of orbits times the number of transformations. Because we know the number of transformations and we want to find the number of orbits, this is very useful. Now, all we have to do is count the number of stabilizers for every coloring. Here's a table showing every coloring stabilizers. But this table reveals something useful. Summing the number of stabilizers of each coloring is the same as summing the number of colorings each transformation stabilizes, or fixes. This is more efficient. Since as the square gets large, the number of colorings grows exponentially, but the number of transformations stays the same. We therefore have the final result. The sum of the number of colorings that t fixes for every transformation t is equal to the number of transformations times the number of orbits, which is what we wanted to find in the first place. This result is known as Burnside's lemma, and it has broad applications in any case where you need to count colorings of objects that are the same under some symmetry group. For example, beads of a necklace which has rotational symmetry, faces of a cube, which has three-dimensional symmetry, and even unlabeled graphs, which have permutation symmetry. However, those examples just scratch the surface of the power of Burnside's lemma. In 1937, George Polya developed a method that took advantage of the fact that each transformation of the big square represents a permutation of the four little squares in order to use Burnside's lemma to compute the number of colorings with specific numbers of black and white squares. This extended method has been applied to countless real-life counting problems, including enumerating chemical compounds with specific numbers of atoms and musical scales with specific numbers of notes. Though the core ideas are simple, Burnside's lemma is an invaluable tool.